My name is Dominic Wee. I'm Corporate Vice President, Manufacturing and Mobility at Microsoft. Welcome to another episode of my video podcast, Relentless Renewal. On this video podcast, we talk about the amazing pace of change and how we master change from a human, business, and technology perspective. Today, we have a very exciting topic that's very, very intertwined with renewal. It's storytelling. Obviously, the faster the world changes around us, the more we need to talk about what's happening and what we want to happen. So I'm very uh, happy to have with us today a master of storytelling, Dominic Wiechmann. Dominic is a journalist. He's a New, a New York Times bestselling author, and he's an entrepreneur and a father of two. And I'm very excited to be talking with Dominic about the art of storytelling. Dominic, welcome to our podcast today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dominic. Great to be on your show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I mean, you have an amazing journey, like share a bit about what brought you here. Well, first of all, I'm not a master of storytelling. There are many, many other masters, but I'm, I'm just one of them, uh, one of many. Uh, I used to be a journalist for many years. I was running two magazines in Germany, national magazines um, uh, called Stern and, and Süddeutsche Zeitung magazine. And uh, after that, I um, so some like 16, 17 years or so. And after that, I um, changed to a to DLD media, which is kind of a TED Talk format in Europe, a bit smaller and more focused on art and business. I did that for two years and that really showed me that storytelling or the journalistic profession, publishing basically, is not um, is not related to printing letters on paper. It's, it's about addressing a target group with a certain message. Uh, and that for me was a big step because um, as a journalist, you language is your tool basically that's your home and changing language from german into english it's a difficult thing changing the way of distribution from like a newspaper or a magazine to a stage is a different thing so in other words um that was a very important uh, step for me for my personal development and after that i decided to write some books and to start a company which i did and uh, doing that now looping group was founded like seven years ago wow that's quite a journey so um, you shared with me that uh, your thinking has evolved about the storytelling and I think you, you shared about the concept of the community narrative. Also, I guess, like how the advance of social media has changed the way how we need to communicate. Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, 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 not, the interesting thing is that um, the world we're living in, and that's kind of profane, but, but it has changed dramatically. We are living in some sort of an editorial society. In other words... A society in which everybody of us is, I mean, everybody who is, uh, has a smartphone and is, uh, is on social platforms uh, is also a, a media brand or should at least think and act like a media brand because you're not just a receiver of messages, you're at the same time, uh, you're also sending messages. And, um, and that's, that's changing. It's changing the way we organize our interests. It's changing the way how we interact. And it's changing the way how we appear in public because the public sphere became became huge, became way bigger than it used to be before, before, uh, uh, before all that. And that, I do think, has severe consequences for communities because communities used to be organized around a, a, around a, a local, around a village, around a region or a country. But today, it's, it's, it's of course possible that uh, communities are uh, related to, to a certain interest and less to a, a, a geographical uh, uh, logic. Um, and, and I do think that when we talk about communities, be it political communities, be it uh, share, shared interests, be it families, for example, um, they, they need to have or they very often do follow a certain community narrative. And for brands in these days, it's for that reason very important. And we, we have witnessed that every day with the brands we work. Um, that, uh, of course, on the one hand, you have the, the why, the how, the what, uh, that, we, that we learned the purpose of your brand or your company. But on the other hand, you have to be very aware of the, of the community narrative of your target groups. What kind of interests do they follow? And, and it, it, it's, it's very important for, for brands these days to connect the why, how and what with those community interests, uh, community narratives. Otherwise, it's very difficult to establish a long lasting relationship. What I find interesting in, in like how you articulate it is also the, the breadth of where storytelling matters, right? Like we, as brands, we talk to our customers, we talk, but we also need to drive change within our companies, right? When there's large companies, that's not easy. You also talked about the family as being a community. 
and the company sorry to interrupt yeah. you the company is is a community as well yes and, and uh, exactly so, so it's very important not just to focus on external communication yeah. but also to on, on internal communication yeah. because i mean you you, you know that better yes. than, than many others uh, you've worked in huge companies yeah. and, and corporations and and i think that storytelling offers a fantastic means to also address change within companies to justify change to explain change to explain the necessity of yeah. change and the reason why yeah i mean we see this a lot at microsoft i mean microsoft also is a big company and microsoft you know was not born the way it is today right and i think it's it's also quite visible from the outside how microsoft has changed over the decades and still we went is, through right? the change yeah we went through the change for cloud and mobile right that was like 10 years ago and now we have the wave of AI and like, again, we're turning the company upside down. And if you have hundreds and thousands of uh, employees, you know, you need to, people need a purpose and they need to understand why it's happening. And, and, and so you need a very compelling story. And I think that's where the storytelling becomes very, very relevant. Yeah, I agree. I think the, if we go kind of to, to the other end of the spectrum, right? I also found that fascinating. Like you told me about the family narrative the other day, right? Like. Let's maybe go there. Like, what's your what's your thinking there? Well, it's actually a, it's 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 more of a negative thing. But but uh, the larger families are, the more often um, we have a phenomenon that was uh, originally described by a, a, I think it was a French sociologist who stressed the point that um, families. I mean, we all know the notion of the black sheep in a family. Uh, I think that's uh, we're, we're not not everywhere, but where the, where a family is, there is most of the time also some kind of black sheep in the family. And the interesting thing is that the rest of the members, the, so the white sheep, so to speak, um, they need the black sheep also as a common denominator and something to permanently talk about. So it also kind of unifies families that there is a point of reference, something, a topic they constantly talk about and so on and so forth. And that shows also how communities work and 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 and. Uh, I mean, it's a. I do think it's a very problematic aspect, but it shows the power of storytelling and how stories can actually also influence reality manipulate reality yeah. and 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 basically putting also people into some corners yeah. where they have difficulties to get out of that corner yeah. again uh, and that shows in my opinion the negative part of storytelling but we have to face that uh, because it is it is there i mean i think it's it's incredibly powerful right like the way storytelling kind of also changed the way we perceive the past Absolutely. Right, like sometimes how we frame it. Yeah, how we frame it. Like I mean, in your in your in your family analogy, like like we live used to live in the U.S. for two years. Our daughter was two years old. I mean, she has no way of remembering what actually happened, but she has a very it's a very vivid part of like of herself and how like I mean she has these memories that we basically instilled into her, right? And yeah, that's and, super fascinating. That's super fascinating. And I, I know you have a you have a story like from from the work you did on your biographies, right? You wrote the biography of Tina Turner, and former German uh, foreign minister Guido Westerwelle. Like, let's maybe talk about that. Right? Well, actually, I wrote their bio autobiography. Yeah. So I was their ghostwriter, and uh, totally different personalities, of course, and and, and, and different different uh, backgrounds. But the uh, let me start with a private story first. I did when I was um, when I when I finished at Stern magazine. This is kind of the was my last journalistic uh, job. I had a garden leave for about a year, and I um, decided to travel the world because my kids weren't in school yet. Together with my wife, we we. Uh, did a journey around the world for six months. And um, the kids were like, I don't know, five or four and five years old. And the interesting thing is I wrote a book, uh, just a circulation of three for each kid and for my wife and myself. So so it wasn't published, of course. And and, and the book was just for the family. And in the book, we described the, uh, the, the tour we did. And the interesting thing is the same as you have just described, Dominic, that um, they have hardly any real memory. What did we do in Singapore? And or uh, how was our time in Sydney? Um, so on and so forth. Um, the whole memory derives from that book. So that showed me, and it's really fascinating, whenever we talk with my kids about that, their, 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 their point of reference is something they have actually only indirectly experienced, in other words, by reading that book. Coming to Tina Turner's autobiography, or, or let's first about the politician, this German foreign minister who unfortunately died, uh, and, and the book was, uh, the reason why I wrote that book was he was diagnosed with leukemia and uh, later uh, unfortunately died from leukemia. Um, and at that time, we didn't have a lot of time because he was already severely sick. So um, he asked me to, to, to write his autobiography, which became some kind of a political testament as well for, for him. 
but the important thing is I didn't speak. I didn't have the time to do like, I don't know, uh, 20, 30, 40 hours interviews. So we had limited time. So I had to, I had to, uh, uh, I had to do a lot of research and, and, and to travel to, the, to those places where he was. I, I mixed my experiences with his stories. And we made that very transparent. I think that is very important to make the transparent because otherwise it's lying to the customer, which you should never do. But the interesting thing is once at some point he, he, he went to a talk show and after the talk, I accompanied him accompanied, and, and, and after the talk show, I said to him, that's so funny that you were, you know, you were describing that restaurant in New York City. And, 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 and that was actually a restaurant where my wife and I were um, during our, our garden leave. And he was never there. And, and he said, yeah, it's a fantastic restaurant. Oh, I enjoyed my time so much there. I said to him, uh, Mr. Vestival, you have sorry to interrupt you, but you have never been there. Of course I have been there. And that's a, a very common experience I made with writing autobiographies for others, that if a story is really strong, it gets adopted by yeah. the people um, um, in, in whose name you write that yeah. story. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's very human, yeah. but it's very fascinating. It also shows, Dominic, the, uh, the danger of yes. storytelling, because you can manipulate reality. Yeah. And that's, that's a, that's, yeah. Should be addressed as well i mean i think this is what's so powerful about these stories because i think it's very relatable i think all of us have these experiences and then i think they they, they scale up obviously right like i think the question is if this is what's happening like in private or in the narrow kind of domain right of like one or two or three people like how does this how does it work when you have like like how does a society for instance right like how does a society write this narrative and um, and and uh, I think the the other piece of the conversation we had was like you know how did the picture we had of the future how did science fiction in the seventies and eighties yeah that's a good example that's a very good impact example impact where we are today right I had just recently not just recently like two years ago I had a very intensive discussion with uh, one of your board members actually with yeah. Reed Hoffman about that uh, and we did a podcast and the interesting thing is that he said uh, 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 um, well. What we experience today is in not not in every in every field, but in large part something that has been thought through in science fiction of the sixties and seventies, and we're building that world that has been described in science fiction some three, four, or five decades ago, and that followed a very utopian vision of a society, uh, uh, which is good, of course. When you look at science fiction today uh, in two thousand twenty-three, not every science fiction we shouldn't simplify that, but but um, there's a a big chunk of science fiction today that follows a very dystopian view of society in 2040, 2050, and so on. So does that mean that the science fiction, or does that mean that reality and, and the devices that are going to be invented, the new technologies and so on and so forth in, in 2040 follows this dystopian view or not? That's a very interesting thought. So the question is basically, can you actually influence reality by telling a certain sort of story or not? Yeah. And I, I have no is, answer. I have no answer. But I think it's important to think about yeah, that question. And I think it's I think it's very timely because we are kind of we're at the cusp of a new age of technology. Right. Artificial intelligence right. is everywhere. And and I think and, there's this piece uh, and, of there's a self fulfilling prophecy, right? I think that's kind of what we're describing here. And well, I should so, interview I should interview you about that. Because <laughs> the fascinating thing is, as you just mentioned, AI technology, of course, will accelerate that phenomena um, massively. I mean, there's no yeah. doubt about it. So the question, or the next interview, yeah. we, we do the other way around. Yeah. I'm going to interview you about what's Microsoft's position yeah. on that. Because it's, it's uh, and since we know it's, it might have bad consequences, yeah. it might have very good consequences, yeah. uh, both are getting accelerated. No, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of layers here, right? And I think you also talked about earlier about how social media has changed the way we communicate. I think now, like... Artificial intelligence, generative AI and social media are mutually reinforcing each other, right? Obviously, there's a question of like, how does communication change? There's a question around regulation, right? Like, how do we, how do we make sure we can, you know, continue to tell truth from false? Um, and and that, I think there's the layer that we just talked about, right? Like, how do we, there's a lot of things I think we need to figure out with artificial intelligence. We need to make sure that, you know, the technology works for us. But I think also, I think particularly where we are in Germany, right? Like, I think people tend to focus on the risks and the dangers and like the unwanted pieces. And that kind of dominates the, 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 the conversation. And back to the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? I think it's also important that we, 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 we think and talk about what we want to happen to the same extent that we think and talk about what we do not want to happen. 
Right, right. Because otherwise, you know, we get into that, you know, we're kind of writing our, our own future. I mean, it, it puts a lot of responsibility on those people who, 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 who have a positive view in society and your interest in, in, in less conflicts and less uh, uh, um, aggression and, and so on and so forth. Because, of course, uh, uh, as you have as it perfectly described, it has the power to, to even worsen the situation. Yeah. But let's focus on, I, I, you, I, I, you're absolutely right on the German angst phenomena that here in Germany, people are focusing on the... On the I mean, almost constantly on the negative part of it, and there is some danger in it. Of course, I don't want to. I don't want to ignore that. But but there's a lot of opportunity as well, and um, and the opportunity is that um, the new world, the new technology, uh, the new status quo gives us the tools in our hands to also unify and create communities and bind people together within communities and motivate them to do positive, constructive, innovative things. Um, that's also possible. So basically, yes, we can rely on regulation, but I'm uh, uh, more of a free market spirit guy. Uh, uh, yes, regulation is is necessary, but it's even more important not to rely only on, on, on regulation when it comes to avoiding dangers, but, uh, um, but kind of uh, uh, accepting the challenge and create something positive. And, and that's possible as well. Yeah, indeed. So we've... We've covered like the broad spectrum of storytelling and, and, you know, from, from what you just said, like, what, what do you think, what's the call to actually like for, for, for all of us, I guess, right? Like, and I think we all, all of us are writing the future as we speak, like, like what's your call to action? Like what, what, how, like, what's your advice to the viewers here? Like how? Well, I mean, it's, it's a, 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 a who am I to advise the viewers, but, but uh, <laughs> just a, some thoughts, some remarks, basically to what you've said. Um, in the at least in the Western world, the feeling of loss mm -hmm. is, is very dominant because we're changing in a, I mean, the, 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 the speed of, of, of change is accelerating from year to year. We all know that we all witness that. And there is, uh, bunch of numbers that prove that. So in that situation of radical transformation in our, of our daily lives, um, fueled by crises, by inflation, by wars, whatever, I do think it's extremely important to be aware of the importance of communication and not for brands that, that not necessarily outside of your company, but also inbound to your own employees, especially when we talk about corporations with huge corporations with thousands of people. So that, that awareness, I do think is very important. Second, it's very important that to know that we can use the new tools of AI that AI provides for for um, uh, further fragmenting society. But whereas the dark side, there's also a light side. And we can use those things for unifying communities, for telling, for justifying change and acting very transparently about, with uh, transparently uh, um, with these new tools. And that is the opportunity. And those two things, to be aware of the, of, of the fact that almost everything today is media. Media is not just an industry anymore. It's still an industry. In decline. Why? Because everything, almost everything is media out there. You are a sender. You yeah. are a media brand by doing that podcast right now. Your boss, Bill Gates, did a podcast recently, many podcasts. He's a media brand as well. Of course, he's also an entrepreneur and he's also a philanthropist, but he's also a media brand. And that has changed. You don't rely on access to society um, through established media brands. So that puts a lot of responsibility to how to act, how to, how to communicate rightly, how to, how to tell the truth, and so on and so forth. Those topics, I do think, uh, are my remarks. Yeah. So you're all mass scale communicators. I think that's great in closing. Thanks so much, uh, Dominic, for joining us today. I'm looking forward to the other interview. <laughs> yes, Dominic, let's do that. Thank you very much for having you on the show and, uh, and have a great day. 